2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one entangled in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him to be a soldier as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer must first partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Thank you. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Amen. And here we're, we're in the second part of a series we started on Saturday. The first three sections of scripture are review. Uh, the name of the, of the series is the, the, the military analogies uh, in the church. Uh, Paul was around the Roman our guard and the Roman army so much that when you read through all of his epistles, there's something to do with the military or warfare or, or a battle in all of, uh, all of his teachings. And so we want to bring those to light. Uh, and we started a series. I opened here because, uh, you know, uh, Paul is talking to his son in the Lord, Timothy, and he, he's telling him, listen, first of all, there's a war going on. I, I think the most ignorant thing that the most ignorance that a, that, a, that a Christian could have is there's not a battle in their life, that there's not two sides to this battle, uh, and uh, hopefully the series will bring that to light. But he says, listen, you know, there's a war going on, there's, there's a battle going on, and anyone engaged in warfare doesn't get entangled with the things in the world. They, they're, they're focused. And when you think about when you join the U.S. Army or Marines, you enlist, you're giving them your life. You're giving them your time. You're giving them your energy, right? It's, you know, essentially they take rule over you at that point. And, and so Paul's talking to Timothy that way. He's saying, listen, you're engaged in a battle. Know who you belong to. Know who you're fighting. Know who you're enlisted to, right? Jesus Christ. And understand that you have to endure in this battle. That, that you, know, we, you know, think about it. You're in a battle somewhere in Afghanistan or around the world. You know, are you, you know, checking your 401k in the field? Are you, you know, what, what are you doing? Where's your mind? Paul's saying stay focused on what's going on. Stay focused on the, the measures at hand because understand that you've enlisted with Jesus in this army. And, that, and, he, and he goes through it again through a lot of the epistles. So... <clears throat> You know, when, when we look at the scripture um, and we look at the, the, the different analogies that we're going to go through over the seven weeks, hopefully it'll bring to you an understanding of what, you know, how we're supposed to live this life. Because Paul really lays it out well. Uh, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And again, this is review. If you did not see Saturday, uh, either go to our website or go to our, our, our YouTube channel and watch it. It's, it's, uh, it'll be more thorough than the review, naturally, that I'm doing now. <clears throat> Second, uh, Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. It says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. So the first thing it says is that there's weapons that we have, and that's one of our sessions. There's a war going on, and that war is not carnal. That war is not fleshly. It's not physical. This battle is spiritual, right? So it says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, physical, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against what? The knowledge of God. And bringing, into, into, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So Paul says there's a war going on, and our, the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal, they're not physical, they're spiritual, 
And, and this war that's going on, and you're going to see, starts inside of you. It's, it's, it's a battle for your mind. It's a battle for your heart. It's a battle for, your, you know, what drives your actions. What does the Lord say in the first, the, the two commandments that he wants us to obey? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, right? And so the battle, Paul's saying here, this warfare is, is inside of us. It begins inside of us, but it's more real in the physical when we see the effects of it in our life, amen? And, you, and again, one of the sessions, and I'll go through the sessions before we start the teaching today, but understand something, that this war is won inside of you. Defense, offense, wherever you go, the war for your peace, the war for your joy, the war for your healing, it's, it all occurs inside first, and then it manifests outside. So go over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Again, I just had to give a little bit of review. I can't help myself. <clears throat> Ephesians 6. In verse 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the attacks of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts, wickednesses in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, Having done all to stand, stand, therefore, having gird your waist with truth, that's the word of God, put on the breastplate of righteousness, that's our standing with God, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, that's the word of God, have the shield of faith, which what faith comes by hearing the word of God, with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of who? The wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation, that's our good standing with God, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, right? Praying always with all prayer and supplications in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Amen? And this talks about the armor of God. And, and when you look at this, you know, he says you're wrestling. We're wrestling against, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So the wrestle, the argument, the frustration, the things that are going on in your life where it appears that you're, you, you have an adversary or adversarial relationship, he's saying the root of that is not physical. The root of that is spiritual. Amen. The root of it is spiritual. They're being driven by a spirit. You're being driven by a spirit. We're all being driven spiritually, and we're seeing the manifestation of that action by who we're listening to, Okay. So again, these, some of these scriptures we'll cover in future sessions. What I want you to get is that whether you realize it or not, or whether you want to believe it or not, or whether you want to embrace it or not, you are in a conflict, in a battle in your life. And you know anybody that dares to step up to do the work of Jesus Christ is going to suffer persecution. You know, and and I, I use this on Saturday. If you, you know, you have money and you're a Christian and you think your success is based on your money and everything's easy breezy and you're happy and you're not doing anything for the Lord, Satan isn't going to bother you. He's going to make you more wealthy because you're no threat to him. But take that wealth and take that energy and try to do something for the Lord and for the greatness of his name. When you step out in that arena, all hell will break loose on you. And you'll see that when we study one of, the, one of the sessions in the future. So understanding this and understanding what's going on, and really when you read the Gospels, Jesus interacted in this warfare every day of his life. I mean, we see him interacting in this warfare. And as we go through the series, you'll see that. But here it says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, and it lays out principalities, w wickednesses, and what it's laying out is Satan's, uh, realm of authority. He has, within his army, okay, he has fallen angels, he has demonic spirits. We, we'll see in the scripture that some of those are geographic, 
Some of those are assigned to individuals. Some of those are assigned to nations. Some of those have demons have sickness attached to them. We see somebody with epilepsy, and Jesus cast the demonic spirit of epilepsy out of the person. And so we, 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 while we don't realize it because it's not being taught in 2018, Jesus confronted these beings every day of his life. And, and Paul confronted these beings every day of, uh, of their life. And so here, really, before we move on, I just want you to see, again, <clears throat> who we're wrestling against. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. These are spiritual beings, <clears throat> fallen angels, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts and wickednesses in heavenly places. You know, it's, it's, it's his order of authority. And, you know, Satan is not probably going to bother anybody directly in this room. But this hierarchy of, of, of evil is out and about us. And we, we see the, the effects of those things. Now, there are seven teachings that we're going to do. I did one Saturday. The first is the objective. You know, what is our purpose? What are we doing here? It's not the plan. It's not our, our plan in life. But what's God's objective? What's going on here? Why is there a battle? Why is, are there two sides? Where do the two sides come from, right? What's the objective of, 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 this, bar, of this battle, right? Uh, and we took that up on Saturday, and I'm going to read one scripture that will answer it for you before we move on. Today we're going to take up offensive action. The Christian, you can't win a battle on defense. You're being attacked. You can avoid defeat. You can avoid disaster. You can make the enemy run, okay? But all you did was maintain when you're defending, okay? So you can't win a war by staying on defense. You can only win a war when you go on offense, okay? So... What is offense? What does that mean? Most Christians are on defense their entire life because things are good and they're doing nothing and then things go bad, they go on defense. They begin to what? They begin to defend. They begin to look at their life to see if there's anything wrong, asking God, please deliver me, right? So they're back on defense. So we're going to talk today about offense and in future weeks we'll talk about defense. We're going to talk about our equipment and our resources. What has God given us to fight this battle? What is, what is it that we have in our care, custody, and control tactically to deploy to win a battle, to save a battle, to defend, and to, uh, to be on offense, right? I mean, every military has those weapons. Well, he gave us some of those today. Well, how do we use them, right? So one of the weeks we're going to talk about equipment and our resources, uh, and then one week we're going to talk about the plan. What's your plan? What is the plan? What, do you, what is your objective? When you, when you leave this earth, did you accomplish your purpose on the earth according to the orders that God gave you? You know, what is that? What's, what's the plan? Uh, we're going to talk about coordination. You know, no army is one man. You know, there's a team, right? So it takes a team. It takes unity and there's power in unity, but we're more fragmented than we've ever been before. We're more selfish in our time and our energy than we've ever been, all of us. I, I put myself in that category as well. <clears throat> but there's power in unity. There's power in, in a single strength. We're, then we're going to take up defense, and then the last teaching is on intelligence. Every military has intelligence. What are the tactics of the enemy? One of, it is, one of them is shock and awe. It's just all of a sudden, bad things flood in, right? And then you, you're paralyzed with fear and paralyzed with what's going on. And so we're going to look at his tactics, and we're going to look at, at not only his tactics, but how to fight his tactics. How do you, how do you stop this? How do you uh, arrange your life so that so that, you know, we're, we're not ignorant of his devices. What, is, what are his capabilities? Because he's, he's much better at making a lot of noise than, you know, we, we give him credit for being extremely powerful, 
But when you, at the end of the day, you have the authority to put him down. And, and, and you know, and, and it's, it's not easy, but we have the authority to stop him in his tracks. And so we're going to look at that. So our, our first session, which was on the objective, if you go over to Ephesians chapter 3, I felt that we had to look at this uh, before we moved on. You know, because understand something. We all have our own battles. We all have our own paradigm, our own perception. At the end of the day, God's agenda, you're either going to get with it or you're not. At the end of the day, you can, you can go live off like uh, on your own, but you're not joined to God. If you're not joined to God in his objectives, if you're not jo joined to God in what he wants to accomplish in the earth, you're, it's like you're, you're beating your chest on the sideline. You're not engaged in the battle, okay? So here are the intention, the, ob the objective. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me to you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So he's telling us about a mystery here, which in other ages or other time periods or other dispensations was not made known to the sons of men as it has been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So here we see, you know, Paul saying there's a mystery. And this mystery was that the Gentiles would become part of the body of Christ. So in the Old Testament, we have the Jewish nation, which was really its own subculture. We had non-Jews joining that subculture, but it was very contained. It was, it was a group of people, right? And because God couldn't change the inside of man without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he kept them contained and he, and he moved them physically in a physical covenant. So he, he trapped them and he brought them down, he brought them up. If they went off the reservation, he brought them into captivity to push them back in. So he kept them corralled for all of those years. But when Jesus came through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, because now salvation and the ability to change us from the inside out. All of the world, all seven billion people on the face of the earth have the av uh, availability of salvation. The ability to come into a relationship with God, to have their sins forgiven, to have their sins put away, to be in right standing with him, and to walk with him all the days of their life. This was a mystery. This was hid even on the day when he went up to heaven, not his resurrection, but his ascension, in Acts chapter 1, the Bible says they were looking for the kingdom to be established. <clears throat> they had no idea the church age was about to begin. And, and, and so it was a mystery all the way to that point. <clears throat> okay, verse um, 6, it says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Of which I become a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power, to me who am least of the least of all the saints, this grace, this revelation was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of ages, in other words, before Adam was born, has been hid in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent or for the purpose or with this objective in mind that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Big language here. Listen to this. He says, for this intent, for this purpose, this mystery was hid from the beginning of creation. This mystery has been hid in God 
that the manifold wisdom of God would be manifested by us, the church. The whole thing comes down, the whole of humanity comes down to us manifesting God's wisdom, not to man only, but to the principalities and powers and dominions in heaven. So in other words, all of the fallen angels and elect angels are watching how we manifest God's wisdom in the earth. And let me tell you that wisdom. You got to look at the big picture. You go back before Adam, hundreds of millions of years, when Satan fell. When Satan fell, a third of the angels fell with him. The earth became a wilderness at that point. You get, don't get this wrong and listen to session three, the big picture, and you'll learn about that. There was, there was civilization here. And so a third of the angels fell, and now God incubates the earth when he creates Adam and creates man, this weak dust of being. And this weak dust being, now Satan's looking, saying, what am I going to do with this guy, right? And then he makes woman, right, Eve. Satan then takes and causes them to do his exact sin, which is what? To, to, to elevate themselves above God, to do what they want to do, right? To not glorify God as God. So they act and they fall, right? So now you have dust man who lives in the physical, who's attached in the physical, right? Being driven by, by Satan. And so now through humanity, God makes covenants and begins to give people strength and begins to give, allow them to outdo David and, and, and Solomon. But when we get to Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, now the Holy Spirit comes in us because we're righteous, and now we move in that authority as God moved, and we reveal the manifold wisdom of God. That's why the Bible says you must bear fruit. Why? If you don't bear fruit. If you don't bear fruit, you're not joined to what God's intent was. Do you understand? That's why you can lose salvation. If you're not revealing God, and you're not manifesting the light into the world, he said, and you can listen to Saturday's message, who lights a candle and puts it under a bed? He wants us to be seen. He wants us to be different. And so when we, when we are different, when we're strong, when you can praise him, when they're ready to take your home, and you can raise your hand and glorify him instead of complaining, what are you doing? You're manifesting an unseen God, a love, and a trust to a God you can't see, even though you're attached to the physical. Right. You understand? So that was session one. If you weren't here or at Victory, please watch it, because we go much more in depth, okay? Today I want to talk about offense. And when you look at offense, it's the only way to win, right? When you go on offense, what's your objective? It's to take ground from the enemy, right? The objective of offense is to break the defenses, to break the stronghold, to break the assets of the enemy so that you can take ground, okay? So you're moving. You're the aggressor, right? Well, most of our orders, almost all of them, are offensive. And, and yet we play defense more than we play offense, you know, because we're, we're, we're used to it. So when you, when you look at offense, it's really going at the enemy in his territory to take that ground back and to attack and to destroy, weaken, break what he owns already. That's offense. Got it? Okay. So go over to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3, and verse 20. It says, And the multitude came together, so they could not so much as eat bread. So now this their picture, a huge crowd is there. But when his, that's Jesus' own people, heard about this, they went out to lay hold on him, for they said he's out of his mind. Jesus' family wanted to have an intervention. 
because they thought he was out of his mind, okay? Uh, and he, he sort of pushes them away later in the chapter. But I think it's funny because here he was these 30 years. Now he's empowered with the Holy Spirit. When he begins to act in that authority that we're talking about today and through the next weeks, they thought he lost his mind. So they wanted to apprehend him in, in intervention. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. So they see something in him that's authoritative that he's having success with, and they attribute it to Satan. Okay? So he called them to himself, and he said to them in a parable, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom, remember there's two sides to a battle, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds a strong man and then he will plunder his house. Okay? Jesus is talking about himself here. He's say, because, because of what he's doing, he's talking about what? Casting out demons, taking authority over demonic spirits, taking authority over, over sickness and disease, right? As he's walking in the earth, his family sees that there's something wrong and different, right? The scribes and the teachers think there's something wrong and different. Jesus teaches them. It's not Satan casting out Satan. I'm casting out Satan. I'm going into his territory. In fact, he says, who can plunder a strong man's house unless he first binds him and then he can plunder his goods? Jesus came into Satan's domain, okay? Anointed of the Holy Spirit and began to plunder what he owned. That's the offense. Do you see it? He came into the world, anointed of the Holy Spirit, and he began to break the chains of darkness and the effect of, of Satan in, in humanity by walking through the earth. And as he did that, people began to change. People began to be set free. People, and we'll, we'll look at it in the scripture today, but I want you to see that he had to do that for us, not for himself. In other words, when he was confronted with a demon or Satan, he took authority at that point, and that was it. There was no arguing, okay? He had to bring us up to that place where we had that authority. So go over to Colossians chapter 2. And I'm going to touch on it. We're going to look at a bunch of other scriptures, and then we're going to go back to it. But I want you to see... Colossians 2, verse 9, it says, For in him, that's in Jesus, and remember what in him, guys that come here regularly, what is in him? It's covenant terminology, right? We're in relationship and contract with God. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you, Colossians, saints, you here today in Rochester, are complete in him, who is the head of all principalities and powers. In other words, Jesus now after this is after the resurrection, is, is, is at the head of all principalities and powers. In him, you, that's us, were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This is covenant language. Old Testament, when God made a covenant with Abraham, he told them to circumcise all males and circumcised newborn males on the eighth day, right? It was a sign of the covenant. It was a sign of joining that covenant that a, that a piece of flesh would be cut off. In the New Testament, it's a circumcision made without hands. It's a covenant made without hands. It's spiritual. That's what that means, okay? Buried with him, listen to this, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also risen with him. Again, what is with? It's covenant terminology with him through faith. So how are we buried with him in baptism and how are we risen with him in baptism? Through faith and what? The working of God, the working of God's plan who raised him from the dead, right? So our plan in the gospel, God's plan in the gospel, our faith in that gospel plan 
connects us to his death, burial, and resurrection, right? And so now we become part of the covenant, okay? Verse 13, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all of your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, Old Testament law, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And listen to this, verse 15 is where I wanted to get to. And having disarmed or destroyed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So Jesus, when he resurrected, destroyed every principality and power, including Satan. He destroyed them. He made an open show of them. And if you're back in Roman days, right, when Rome would go in and they would destroy a city because the city rose up against them, they would destroy the city. They would take the princes, the king, the generals of the military. They would strip them naked and they would parade them back to Rome and they would parade them through the streets of Rome uh, and then they'd execute them and put them outside the city wall. What were they doing? They destroyed them, but they made an open spectacle of them. Jesus did that to Satan, all the principalities, the spiritual authorities that we're going to talk about. He destroyed them. He completely crushed them. So they're in submission, right? Satan still has a lease, and he's still called the God of this world. However, us in Christ, he brought us to a point or when you look in the book of Acts, Peter and Paul, Stephen, Philip, as they moved, they took authority over what Satan had and they destroyed it. Okay? We don't see it today because we don't teach it today. But they took authority. You read the book of Acts, you read the Gospels in the book of Acts, and every single day, every single one of them is attacking Satan offensively. It's offense all the way. What is go into the world and preach the gospel? It's offense. Go. Go into his kingdom. Go into his domain and destroy. Do you guys see that? Do you understand that? So, so we have this authority. In fact, go, go over there. Go over to um, Mark uh, 16. Verse 15, he says to them, what does he say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who, is, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he who is, does, not, does not believe will be condemned. Well, what are we doing there? We're taking all unsaved people, we're going out, we're presenting the gospel. Those that believe, what are we doing? We're taking them from Satan. We're taking them from Satan. We're ripping people away from him and bringing them into our family. It says, and these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. What is that? That's offense. That's authority. That's taking authority. They will speak with new tongues. That's our new language we see in the, in the book of Acts. They will take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. In other words, will go in God's protective power. They will lay hands on the sick and what? They will recover right? So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, sat down at the right hand. What did Jesus do? He sat down at the right hand because he was done. They, what did they do? They went out into the world. Where's that? Satan is the God of this world. And what did they do? They preached everywhere. The Lord working with them, confirming the words that they preach with what? Accompanying signs and power. Amen? Those are the weaponry. That's the authority we have. So we go out and we take from him. A good example of this is go to Joshua chapter 1. Because there's an order to this. And you have to understand the order to this. Go to, go to Joshua chapter 1. Verse 2, it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, 
and you and all of this people to the land which I what? I'm, I've given to you. I've given you this land and the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your feet will tread upon, I have given to you, as I said to Moses. In other words, God said, here's this land, I've given it to you, right? From the wilderness of this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. In other words, I've given it to you. This is my promise. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and very courageous. For this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers, to your fathers, to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or the left that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success as i have commanded you be strong and of good courage do not be afraid nor dismayed for the lord god is with you wherever you go okay so here's the key points here the, the first thing you need to understand is the promise what has god given us what belongs to us what do we what has god spoken and given us in Christ Jesus. Whatever that promise is, in the Old Testament, they were walking into a land. That was the promise. In the New Testament, we walk in the promises of what God has ordained to be ours. So any promise to the church is a promise to you. Any promise in covenant is a promise to you. So they know what the promise is, they see the land. We have to know what the promises is by walking in the land. Notice that God's covenant people had to keep this relationship fresh. He said, meditate on the word day and night. In other words, engage with me every day, right? Three times he said, be strong. Don't turn to the right hand. Don't turn to the left. Don't sin. Keep your relationship with me strong. And we see, if you go to, you, I think it's Joshua 7, you see that they lost the battle because there was sin in the camp, right? God said he'd never leave or forsake, but we leave and forsake, right? So he says it three times, be strong, meditate in the word, don't turn to the right hand or to the left, obey what I've given you, and he, then he makes a promise. If you do that, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'll be with you no, no matter what you do. You see that? So number three is he's with us, right? And number four is, it says, then you'll make your own way prosperous. Look at what it says. You have to look at it. You have to look at it. It says, uh, uh, look, verse 8, it says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in, for then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. Where? into the promises that I've already given you. Obedience brings the blessing, guys. Everybody wants to talk about once saved, they want to arm wrestle over it, they want to debate it. Listen to me. God blesses those that obey him. God, we, we bless ourselves by obeying him. Amen? So offense is going in to the enemy territory. What did they do? They went into the enemy territory they began to take what God had given them away from the enemy. They began to possess the promise in their own lives. We do the same thing in the New Testament. You know, I don't have time, but in Joshua chapter 10, here's your homework. Read Joshua chapter 10 about the five kings. The five kings' names are, 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 are names that are, can be attributed to Satan. I want to I finish on time. Uh, at the end, they battle the kings. Joshua takes the five kings, and he has his commanders put his feet on their neck, and then he kills them. And he says, this is what the Lord will do to your enemies. 
Jesus said, I, you, I, you will tread on scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means will hurt you. You know, we try to equate wealth to godly success. I mean, it's natural human terms to say that if the wealthier you are, the more successful you are with God. That is garbage. It's, it, in fact, money is Satan's heroin. Okay? Because with money you have options. If you have a call and a purpose, you may not answer that call and purpose if you have abundant wealth. So you, you really, we, we have to change the way we think to understand about this battle. And I said it on Saturday. I have, you know, lots of friends that have lots and lots of money, but th and they think they're good with God. At the end of the day, you, they're going to lay on a slab next to a homeless man on a slab, and God's going to require, what did you do? I didn't mean to make you uh, wince with that. <laughs> but I said, <laughs> I've seen people, oh. <laughs> but, but, but what are you taking with you? Right, right, and, but, but you are taking something with you, and it's what you did in the spirit. It's what you did in the spirit. It's not the physical. You know, so, you know, God gives us the ability to obtain wealth to do what? To, 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 to change lives, to help lives, to, to bring about change. Amen. Go over to Luke chapter 13. And I want to show you we, we can teach weeks on this. I, I just want to give you a flavor of what we're talking about. Luke 13, verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, a woman who had a what? Spirit. This is a being that has a voice of infirmity, 18 years, was bent over and could no way rise herself. So she was bent over as she walked through life. But when Jesus saw her, he called to her and said to her, Woman, you are what? Loosed from what? Your infirmity. So she was bent over and she had this infirmity. Jesus spoke. What did he do? He spoke and he loosed her from the spirit of infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight. And what did she do? She glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which a man ought to work. Therefore, uh, come and be healed uh, them on, not on the Sabbath day. In other words, you can heal on the other days, but not the Sabbath day. The Lord answered him and said, Hypocrites, does not each one of you on the Sabbath day loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead them to take them to water? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, what does that mean? In covenant with God, whom Satan, who bound her? whom Satan has bound. And he goes, think of it. For 18 years, be what? Loosed. So she was bound. Jesus came in and loosed her. Do you see that? Who was she bound by? Principalities, powers, dominions, mites. One of Satan's crew, right? Spirit of infirmity. I don't know what you call this disease, but it's probably arthritic somehow, and she's bent over. Jesus undid what Satan had done for 18 years. So she was bound, he loosed her. Okay? Go over to Mark chapter 5. So then they came, verse 1, to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gergesenes. And when he had come out of the, the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, so he lived in a cemetery. No one could what? Bind him, not even with chains. 
because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him. The shackles were broken in pieces, neither could anyone, what, tame him. So they couldn't bind him. They couldn't tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out, cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran to worship him. And he cried out with a loud voice, saying, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not, what? Torment me. Get the picture now. The Spirit is speaking. He's crying out. He's saying, Jesus, don't torment me. Then he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding near the mountains, so all the demons begged him. He sent them to the swines, and they entered them. So, so here we have a, a man who, again, it's a spirit, right? And we don't know that the other people heard this demonic spirit speaking to Jesus, and, and nobody could bind him, nobody could tame him, nobody can contain him, but the presence of Jesus was known by him, right? He knew who Jesus was in the spirit realm, just like the devils know who you are, believe it or not, in the spirit realm. They know who we are. Jesus takes authority over him. There's no question about the authority of Jesus, right? He takes authority of them. What does he do? He binds him and he tames him. This man now is released from what he had. Do you see that? So we see two stories where we see spirits. And as you go through, because you read over it, you don't see it. There's demonic spirits. There's fallen angels. You know, and as you go through the Bible, these, these are spiritual forces. What did this man do? He cut himself. What did he do? He cut himself. What is that? Why does somebody cut themselves? It's demonic. It's demonic. You know, we want to go talk to a shrink and we want to talk to a therapist. At the end of the day, somebody has to take authority over the spirit that's driving those actions. You know? And, 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 and so... So now, what, is, what, is, what happened here? Go over to uh, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. <clears throat> and for the sake of time, verse 15. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, and said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to them, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, spiritually, who is in heaven, revealed it to you. And I say to you, You are Peter, and upon this rock, not the rock of Peter, but the rock of the saying, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. I will build my church in the gates of what Hades shall not prevail against it. So there's the war, right? Two sides. Our side and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth will be what? Bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what's he saying there? He's saying, I'm giving you the keys on earth to be able to take authority to bind and to loose. Well, what did we just read? We loose the person with sickness and we bound the person with sickness, right? We bound the spirits and, and remove them. Do you understand? How did he do it? Did he arm wrestle with them? He spoke his authority. He spoke his authority. He spoke his authority, and hell lined up with his words and obeyed them. And if you go in the book of Acts, you can read the whole book of Acts, and you'll see the same thing. 
okay? The trouble is we don't see it today. We don't teach it today. Most people don't even know about it today. They're, they're, they're under demonic oppression. And, you know, uh, what is the spirit of fear? It's a spirit. Right, it has a voice. You know, Jesus said this again, you know, in Matthew 18. Look at what he says in Matthew 18. Because we're going to look at this in a couple of weeks. He says, Assuredly, verse 18, Assuredly I say to you, whatsoever things you bind on earth will be what? Bound in heaven. What comes first? You. Take the authority. Go and bind. Heaven will work with you. Whatever you loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. And again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. So what, what do we see here? You know, that's going to be uh, a coordination or our coordinating. But we see it again. Whatsoever things you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. You know, Jesus, what did he do when Satan came to him after he was in the wilderness? Satan brought up a temptation. What did Jesus do? He spoke the word of God, right? That's defense. That's more defense. Satan's coming to attack. He was defending. But the third time, you know what he said? He said, get thee behind me, Satan. He ordered him to get out of his, out of his path and be removed from his path so he can get on with his life. The Bible says the devil left him. How did he take authority? He spoke it. He spoke it. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter uh, 1. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 4 it says, Greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. Paul's writing to Timothy and he says, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of the tears. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded it's in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor me as prisoner, but share with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Okay? So here, Timothy, I want you to, I want you to see this. Timothy is in great fear 1 Timothy was written to a man whose church was expanding, so Paul, the Holy Spirit, told him how to build the church, how to appoint people. 2 Timothy is under siege. People are being persecuted, arrested, killed. His church is shrinking. So Paul hears about his tears, but he also hears about his fear. So what does fear do? It puts you on defense. Fear puts you on defense. What are you, what are you doing? God, deliver me. God, save me. God, help me. God, change this. What are you doing? You're praying for the mercy and power of God to deliver you. There's nothing wrong with that. But what does Paul tell him to do? He's not giving you a spirit of fear, but of what? Power. We can understand love and a sound mind, right? God loves you and a sound mind, but what's the power? In other words, he's giving you the power to get through this. Get on offense. Begin to pray, intercede, come against these. What are we doing? We're wrestling against what? A siege by Satan. What's happening in our nation? Look at the darkness in our nation. It's a spirit. It's not a Democrat or a Republican or an independent, right? It's a spirit. And, 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 and you have to recognize it because you can arm wrestle all day and, 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 and not win. You have to win it vertical, not horizontal. You can't. You can't. So, you, so we see here, he tells Timothy, listen, don't be ashamed. Endure what's coming at you. But get the power back. Remember who you were. Remember when the Holy Spirit moved when I laid hands on you. Engage in the battle. Don't cower in a closet. 
Take ground. Don't, don't let them take it from you. Now, you know, you can battle yourself to death. It doesn't matter, right? Because we go to heaven, right? We, we know that there's a heaven. But we can't live our days here letting Satan roar at us and we run into a closet. We have to turn it around and take authority. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? So when, when Jesus said, go into the whole world, he's saying, go in and take it from him. He owns it already. Take it from him. What they were doing here is, Timothy had this great pushback and they had this great expansion and Satan was trying to what? Plunder it and destroy it. Paul said, I'll fight, let them put me in chains and I'll still write letters of epistle. Let them try and kill me and God will raise me up and I will go and it's my time to go and he says it's time to go. Until them, I'm attacking. That was Paul. You guys see that? Now I want you to see something. Go over to Ephesians chapter 1. This is great prayer for both you and intercession. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. It says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. What's, who's he talking about? The Ephesian church. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may what? Give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So what's he praying for? He's praying that they wouldn't be ignorant, that they'd have wisdom, revelation, and knowledge, right? He's praying that their eyes would be open, that they would see the word of God. Revelation knowledge is, is, is God's word to us, right? So he's praying for that, that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. The, literally, it says the eyes of your cardio, your heart, would be enlightened, that you would know what is the hope of his calling and what the richness of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So he, what is he saying here? He's praying daily for them. He's not praying for them to be wealthy. He's not praying for them to get new dealerships or new cars. Or he, What does he do? He's praying that they would have knowledge and understanding of what belongs to them. Okay? And he says, I pray that you be enlightened, that you would know and understand. Look at verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at, at his right hand in heavenly places, far above what? Principalities, powers, mights, and dominions, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. What is he saying there? That he conquered these principalities and powers, all these wickednesses that we're fighting with? And what did he do? Verse 22, when he put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So what's Paul's intercessory prayer? God, that they would know your word, that your word would come alive to them, that they would know your promises, that they would understand what belongs to them, that they would understand what the precious blood of Jesus bought for them, that they would understand your redemptive names, right? Jesus, my healer my deliverer, right? My righteousness, my banner, my strength, my peace. You know, Jehovah Shalom, my peace, right? He said, I want you to know, I want you Ephesians' eyes to be open, that God would fill you with knowledge and understanding that you would know what is the exceeding greatness of the power you have inside of you. So that's what, you can walk in it. You know, when, when, the, the, when the disciples had a, a man come in fact, let's look at it. It's in, in uh, Matthew's Gospel. Go to Matthew. Matthew six seventeen. It says, and when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is epileptic. You see that? Epilepsy. And suffers severely, and often he falls into fires and awful, often in the waters. What's he doing? He, oh, I'm sorry, verse 14. 
I was having my own party there. <laughs> okay, when he had come to a multitude, a man came to him kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic. He suffers severely, for often he falls in the fire and into water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not, what, cure him. Now remember, the disciples had been sent out two by two prior, and they had healing success, okay? He says, And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. He rebuked them for not having the strength to do this. Jesus rebuked what? The demon. So what's epilepsy? Demonic oppression, right? It came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Disciples came to Jesus privately saying, why could we not cast them out? Jesus said to them, because of what? Your unbelief. What did he tell Joshua? Meditate on this word day and night. Meditate on it day and night. Read the word every night. How does faith come? By hearing and hearing the word of God. What did he say? Read it day and night. Don't let it leave your lips. Keep reading it. Keep reading it. Keep looking at it. Have an insatiable desire to eat the word of God, to hear it, to, to listen to it. He says, so Jesus said, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, be real, I'll removed from here to there, and it will be moved, and nothing will be impossible. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So what's he saying there? What, what is, what, what's prayer and fasting? First of all, he's, he's telling them the issue is unbelief. So what do they have to do? They have to bolster their faith right? And what is he saying? Prayer and fasting. What does that do? It makes you spiritually sensitive. It makes you stronger in the Lord, right? So what he's saying is you're lacking strength in the spirit from being able to do this. So when I was young, I mean, I seen many miracles. I went to a school where the minister, Kenneth Hagin, had a healing ministry. So we hear, we've seen healings all the time. It was, it was like second nature, you know, and he has special anointing for that, for that healing. But if you go back to then, which is the early 80s, to now, I haven't heard a church teach on, on, on healing, demonic oppression, casting out demons for 20 years. I haven't heard it for, it may be longer than that. Yet, it occupies all of the New Testament. So we, we now have this ability, and Paul's praying for his saints to have that ability <laughs> to step up and, and, and to take authority. So how do you do it? You speak. How do you, what's the spirit of fear? You go home tonight, you've got crushing pressure on you for something going on in your life. What do you what do? You do? What, what, the spirit of fear comes and you, it grips you. You're uneasy, you're oppressed, there's pressure. What do you do? You, you have to speak to it. You have to get up and speak and take authority over it, bind it, cast it down, and command the peace of God to fill your heart and your mind. This is how we fight. This is how we fight. You know, you can, you can put a, uh, someone in a straitjacket, you can put them on an IV drip, you can do whatever you want. This is how we fight and destroy the kingdom. You've got a kid addicted to drugs, what is that? It's a spirit. It's a spirit, right? I mean, something, something that's used, that could be used for a good means is now used for addiction in, in people. You know, that's why you can argue, argue horizontally, but understand something, you'll win it vertically. You'll win it vertically. And, 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 you know, it's, it's, we, we see uh, uh, Jesus, we see his authority and things moving, but we see also in the Bible, we see there's delays. There's people that got healed as they went, right? And I've seen it where people are healed as they go. You know, but, but again, if you're not teaching it, and I, and I have to put myself in that category, it's hard to have faith for it if it's not in the forefront of your mind. You know, if it's not in the forefront of your mind, you, you, you go with the human answer first before you go with the spiritual answer, right? 
because you're, you're used to doing that. That's what you're used to doing, right? So with that, we're going to close. Uh, i got to speak to the camera. This is my uncomfortable part. Thank you for watching today. Uh, we, we invite you to let us know what you thought of our teaching. Uh, we invite you to go to our website and look at some other teachings and join our email list and become part of our community here. You'll receive uh, blogs and other materials. You get notification on when we're teaching a day in advance or the same day. But we invite you to join us uh, here at Bible Study. Uh, with that, we're going to close in prayer. I want everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. If you need prayer for healing, I want you to come forward. Uh, just stand up here at my right or my left. Uh, Father, we just thank you for this time of fellowship. We thank you for this time, Father, where we've come together to seek wisdom and truth, which is found in your word. Uh, Father, we bring some prayer requests up before your throne. Uh, Father, we pray for, um, it looks like uh, Renee, uh, uh, no, the American Church, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Father, for uh, an outpouring in this church, Lord. We pray that, Father, you would, uh, you would encounter the pastor and the leadership, Father, to touch them and change them. Father, we pray for Debbie, who has eye surgery, that her, her uh, sight would return. We pray that she would come out without complications, without side effects. We pray for total and complete restoration and healing. We pray for Ron, who has a pacemaker on 10% heart function. Father, we pray that you would strengthen Ron's heart, strengthen him, Father, in Jesus' name, and cause him, Father, to rise from this uh, bed of infirmity. Uh, Father, we pray for, Father, those that aren't here, Father, who uh, are gripped with the flu, Father, that's going around. We pray for all of the saints in Detroit which are gripped with the flu. Father, we pray, Father, your healing power. And Father, we pray, Father, for healing, Father, for, for our, our, our sister. We pray for healing her body, Father. We pray that her whole body would be restored. We come against, Father, uh, the, the issues of, that bring about these sores. Father, we pray for complete and total restoration and complete healing in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we thank you for our president. Father, I just feel led to pray for our president, Father, as they continue to attack him, continue to come against him. But Father, he's rolling back single-handedly the darkness that has gripped our land, Lord. He's, he's taking back, he's, he, he, he's, he's doing... Father, the work of, of, of reversing, Father, what, what happened to us over the previous eight years, Lord. He continues to defund and change laws and regulations that enhance righteousness and enhance the church. So, Father, we pray that you would protect him, Father, and continue to give him wisdom, surround him with those, Father, that, that know your way and continue to pour into his life. And Father, we pray against all those that would try to take him down. Father, we pray that they would fall into their own pit, Father, and be destroyed. We bind them in the name of Jesus and command them to take their hands off. And every weapon formed against him would not prosper. Father, we pray that this land would move back to you, Lord God. Pray for revival. Revive in the hearts of men and women who have controls over groups, Lord, pastors and teachers. Father, anoint them, Father, to turn things back, Father, and to invade Satan's kingdom and destroy it and plunder it. Father, we thank you for this series. We pray that you continue to give us revelation, wisdom, and knowledge. Father, we pray that for those that pray for us, Father, that you would return to them, Father, great favor. For those that give into our ministry, we pray that you would give them a hundredfold return on their investment. And Father, we pray that you'll continue to give us revelation and wisdom to unlock, Father, the mysteries of the scripture, to make them known to us and to impart wisdom every week. We give you glory and praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. No Bible study this Saturday. Uh, it's uh, the fourth Saturday, so the following week will be the first week of February. So I'll see you next Tuesday.